Hi everyone, this is Andrew Hoffman. I'm a security researcher and technical author based out of the Pacific Northwest. I'm going to be breaking down an actively ongoing malware incident that's affecting a large number of people. It is a malware for Visual Studio Code, the popular code editor that is produced by Microsoft. And I'm going to be walking us through this technical breakdown that koi.ai has released to the public. So this is being dubbed Glassworm and the name for this malware will make sense in a minute, but it's very interesting. I have some keynotes on the left-hand side. This malware is harvesting NPM, GitHub, and Git credentials. It's targeting 49 cryptocurrency wallets and wallet extensions, stealing funds. It's deploying SOX proxy servers to take over developer machines. It's installing hidden VNC servers. This is on developer laptops, by the way. Anyone with a compromised Visual Studio code plugin that has the appropriate levels of permissions for those plugins will have all these compromises deployed on their laptop or on their desktop computer. And it's making use of these stolen credentials that it's getting, C line number one, to compromise additional Visual Studio Code packages. So it's self propagating. One developer gets compromised, they're using this plugin. Now they have their own Visual Studio package, that Visual Studio Code package, and then that Visual Studio Code package gets compromised, so on and so forth. So let's go on the right hand side. Let's jump through this a little bit, walk through what's going on. So it says current state, seven OpenVSX extensions were compromised on October 17, 2025. That's approximately three days ago with about 35,800 downloads. 10 extensions are still actively distributing malware as you read this. So my assumption is that it started with a total of seven extensions. And since it is designed to be self-propagating, there are now 10 known extensions that are actively distributing malware. So pay attention to what extensions you have in Visual Studio Code if you make use of Visual Studio Code. And it says right here on the 19th, they have an update that the new infected extension was detected in Microsoft's Visual Studio Code marketplace. So maybe there is up to 11 known packages that are distributing this malware right now. So we, we skip down here and we get into the meat of the malware. How is this malware being distributed without being detected in Visual Studio Code packages? Well, if we look at this screenshot, it says CodeJoy's extension source code. CodeJoy is an extension for Visual Studio Code. It'll, you'll notice that right here we go to, uh, let me see, zoom out a little bit. Uh, do I have this right here? There we go. So line one, two, three, there's a lot of blank space, and then it goes to line four right here. That's because they're using Unicode characters that aren't supported by Visual Studio Code. So it looks like white space, but it's actually code appearing within here that's just not being rendered in a way that you can read it. So this is one of the techniques that they're using to mask this malware and make it harder to detect through your eyes, of course, should still be machine detectable. Jumping back over here, it says, Yep, massive gap between lines two and seven, or I'm seeing between three and five, but certainly there's a lot of white space here. There's a lot of white space here in the editor. It says unprintable Unicode characters that don't render in Visual Studio Code. They say the malware is invisible, not obfuscated, not hidden in a minified file, invisible to the human eye. Yeah, you know, that's probably just invisual, invisible in Visual Studio Code. It should still be visible to any machine static analysis, which makes me question why this hasn't been detected sooner. But jumping forwards to a more interesting point, they're using Solana blockchain as a distributed, decentralized, uncensorable command and control. What does that mean? Well, here they give some examples, but the important part is if we jump back to the notes here, they have a couple command and control servers. They have a primary server. It looks like just a centralized normal web server like most malware. They're also exfiltrating to a different server. But then under the condition that let's just say like the FBI takes down number one, number two, they have other mechanisms from which they can remotely update the malware. One of them being this Solana wallet and the other being Google Calendar. So let me explain how that works. So here's the Google Calendar invite right here. And the idea is that no network firewall is going to block Google Calendar because it's not considered to be a malicious software application. But what this Google Calendar invite does is it includes data, which is base64 encoded in the invite. So the software, if it can't reach out to its primary server right here for command server, what it's going to do is it's going to reach out to Google Calendar and it's going to get this base64 encoded payload. Let's decode it right here. And you'll notice that this spits out another server. 
So in the case that this server is taken down, the software, the malware, will reach out to Google Calendar, which is pretty hard to censor, pretty hard to block. Now, Google could obviously ban this account, but they could spin up another one. And then this server will spit out a Base64 encoded payload that includes another newer command server right there. It looks like the original one is still online, so it looks like nothing's happened there yet. And then in the case that they get banned from Google Calendar and they want to keep this malware active and keep updating it, they have a decentralized and uncensorable option right here. This is something that a lot of malware producers, a lot of hackers have been doing recently. It makes it very, very difficult to stop their malware from updating itself. So here we have a Solana wallet. Now, if you go to the Solana wallet, you'll notice there's two transactions. Let's go to the most recent transaction. You'll see in the instruction details here, so in, in the payload, in the metadata for the Solana cryptocurrency transaction, they have another base64 encoded string. We can go to our developer tools, we can decode that. And you'll see we get access to, once again, the first server right here. But in the case that the first server is taken down, they would create a new transaction, which is uncensorable on the Solana blockchain. And they would include new metadata in this JSON right here, which would include a pointer to a new C2 server. So this is, this is an interesting pattern that's going to become more and more common and make it more and more difficult to censor malware at the firewall at the network level without having to do something like censor the entire Solana blockchain. And as you know, cryptocurrency grows in its usage, that might not be feasible in the future. So there's gonna to have to be new solutions to bypass this limitation. So Koi says this is absolutely brilliant and terrifying. This has actually been going on for a couple of years now. There are malware developers who have been doing this, but it is becoming more and more popular. So what they're saying is it's immutable. You, you know, you can't censor these transactions. It's anonymous. It is can in fact be relatively totally anonymous depending on how these crypto wallets are set up and where they get their coins from and so on and so forth. Censorship resistant, that's the big one. You can't just take down one URL. The only thing you could do is just take down the, you know, block the entire Solana blockchain from your network. And in the long term, that might not be a good solution. And then they're, they're flagging some additional concerns as to why this is a good solution. Yes, it's quite cheap. It's a cheap way of hosting a small amount of malware metadata. You couldn't host the whole malware here. That would become expensive. But just hosting a URL or two, pretty simple. And then that URL can be used to update the malware. The malware just reaches out to the blockchain if it can't access the Google Calendar or the primary server. So beyond that, there's doing a lot of credential harvesting right here, and I recommend you read this whole technical walkthrough. They're walking through how they're harvesting credentials, but something important to note is that they've identified that this malware is harvesting, it's targeting crypto wallet extensions, MetaMask, Trust Wallet, Phantom Coinbase Wallet. So if you think that you've been using any Visual Studio Code extensions that may be vulnerable to this malware, you may want to double check and secure your crypto wallets, else you might find your funds missing. And uh, that is one of the primary purposes, I imagine, of this, this malware right here. So they're looking for NPM authentication tokens. That's part of the self-propagation. If you are affected by this malware and you have your own NPM package, it's going to try to propagate itself by using your NPM auth token to push its malware into your packages. It might be the same with GitHub repos. And now for the OpenVSX credentials, this of course is part of the propagation get credentials and the crypto wallets to ultimately get your money, which I imagine is kind of like the end goal. And this is just how the hacker intends to get to the end goal of obtaining your cryptocurrencies. They noted here the Google Calendar link that I just demonstrated. It's all very simple. It's base64 encoded URLs that point to command and control server, potentially to another exfiltration server, since it appears that they at least have different IP addresses, they might be different servers. And they pointed out the Google Calendar solution as a backup C2 it is pretty robust as well. Probably not as robust as the Solana blockchain, but yes, right here they have three different ways of getting in contact with command and control server. They have the traditional direct IP, which is what malware producers used to use. And they have some of these more decentralized or dif more difficult to censor services as well. So it says right here, there's a zombie payload URL, and that's one of the pay payload URLs that we decrypted right there. And it says this is their full spectrum remote access Trojan. What they're saying is it's not only stealing your crypto and 
trying to self-propagate itself, but it's also installing software on your developer machine so it can take over your developer machine. And you'll see a couple instances of this being demonstrated on the Koi website. Everything as far as even installing a hidden VNC server so a hacker could potentially just remotely operate your computer and dive into all your files and so on and so forth. This is a pretty sophisticated malware. I don't know, it says it's widespread right here, 35,800 installations. I don't know what the total impact in the end is gonna be, but that would suggest there's at least 35,800 compromised developer machines right now. And because of the level of sophistication of this attack, you can assume that all 35,800 of these developer machines are really fully compromised and there is it's unlikely that it's worth trying to eliminate the malware. It's more likely that you'd have better luck if you are compromised, completely wiping your drives and starting afresh. That's probably the safest solution. So for those of you watching, click the link in the description below if you want to learn more about this glassworm malware. You probably realize now they're calling it glassworm because it appears to be transparent to the user of Visual Studio Code based on its base six, uh, based on its um, Unicode encoding. Now, if you believe you've been affected by this malware, there's a couple steps you're going to have to take. Number one, because the malware is compromising your whole device, you're going to want to take your laptop, wipe your hard drive, and make sure that you clean the sectors. Don't just mark the sectors. So you want to do a deep wipe of your laptop or your desktop prior to in reinstalling your operating system. Once you've reinstalled your operating system, or perhaps a couple steps beforehand, depending on if you have any cryptocurrency or not, you're going to want to probably create new cryptocurrency wallets and transfer out all of the cryptocurrency in your existing cryptocurrency wallets in the case that the private keys for those wallets have been compromised. And any active sessions that you might have had active on your developer laptop, the one that was compromised with the Visual Studio Code plugin, this could be anything open in a web browser, this could be any tool or command line utility that you have active that uses some sort of authenticated token to communicate with a web server. You're going to want to go to each and every one of those services, you're going to want to reset your credentials, make sure that you have your MFA installed, and double check to see if any sessions have been compromised. Some of these services will give you the ability to see your uh, your authentication attempts. You're going to want to go through each and every one of those, make sure that they came from you and they did not come from someone remotely operating your PC or making use of compromised tokens. And once you've done that, you probably are in a much better position than you were prior. So like always, stay safe. I hope that this information was valuable to you and double check your Visual Studio Code extensions to make sure that you're not compromised by this or other Visual Studio Code malware. Have a great day.